This is 6035 Media. Ready? Oh, cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. You are at the League of Women Voters at Large City Council Candidate Forum. Thank you for joining us. My name is Shelley Roars. I am the spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak Region and your MC this evening. Um, to my left are your moderators, Brian Grossman for 6035 Media. He is the executive editor, and Angie Stevens, Colorado Springs NAACP president and a league member. Have to disclose that. Um, also here tonight are your candidates. In alphabetical order, you have Glenn Carlson, Lynette Crow Iverson, Janita Davis, Catherine Cat Gale, Jay, sorry, Jamin Johnson. Gordon Klingenschmidt, David Lineweber, Roland Rainey Jr., and we're missing a couple here this evening. For, the, for those that aren't here, you also have Jane Northrop Glenn on the um, ballot, as well as Jay Inman and Brian Reesley, who are not joining us this evening, but we're invited. Elected officials in attendance this evening. I know I've got one uh, D11 school board member back here, Julie Ott. She's one of our elected officials. Am I missing anybody that I, elected official that came in the room that I missed anybody? No? Very well. Your timekeeper this evening is Terry. She's around here somewhere. For those of you candidates, she is your guide, right? She will tell you when to move on. <laughs> so please be aware of your timekeeper. League members, for those of you here in attendance, you have a full house. League members, if you don't want to get up, just raise your card. A league member will come to you. If you need a card or a pencil for a question, again, most of our questions are from your audience, so please make sure you get your questions submitted. Co-sponsors this evening, thank you for those. Black and Latino Leadership Coalition, Citizens Project, Colorado Latinos Vote, KRCC, Latina Equity Foundation, NAACP, and 6035 Media. The video that you're seeing this evening will re remain available on the LWVPPR website and 6035 Media Facebook pages and the YouTube channel. So you can access it there. And make sure you, um, all of the candidates, thank you to those who participated in our podcast, um, 6035 Media and the League of Women Voters Making Democracy Work did all, interviewed all of the candidates and they will go and be uh, published tomorrow. So you can check those out live tomorrow. Um, let's see, format description, all of the candidates, thank you for signing your candidate agreement. This is, um, they have, are abiding by our rules as the league, so we appreciate you participating this evening. Again, submit those questions, the league volunteers are here to assist you with that. Housekeeping items, audience members, we would appreciate you not shouting out or clapping during the forum. It is kind of, it helps things move along and we will have time for that at the end, so we do appreciate that. Silence your phones for me, if you wouldn't mind putting those on vibrate. And of course, restrooms are literally right behind us in the, in the hall. So my job is pretty much done for a little bit, but I'm going to turn it over to your moderators and we're going to get started. So thank you very much again for joining us. Are we doing a quick intro of ourselves? Or? Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, so like uh, Shelly said, my name is Brian Grossman. I'm executive editor of 6035 News Magazine. Um, just really quickly, for those who aren't aware, uh, if you were familiar with The Independent and the Colorado Springs Business Journal um, and some of the other publications we did as Colorado Publishing House, those have all been condensed into the new 6035 News Magazine. We have some up front if you wanted to grab one on your way out. Um, one quick amendment to what Shelley said, uh, our 6035 Vote podcast is already live. It went up yesterday, so you can get a little head start on uh, some of the candidate interviews that we've done over the past few months. Uh, if you go to 6035media.org slash election, all of our election content is there to include 23 uh, candidate interviews with mayoral and city council candidates. So uh, we appreciate your time in doing that, and uh, hopefully you guys check that out. I'll pass it on to Angie. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angie Angela Stevens. Um, I'm the president of the Colorado Springs branch NAACP here. I am the third female president in the 103-year branch of Colorado Springs, so I'm very excited about that. 
Um, I am honored to be here today with you, and I look forward to this forum. So for those of you who don't know our forum guidelines, the candidates get to speak in alphabetical order first in the order of the ballot. They get a one-minute introduction. Then the uh, moderators will be able to give them, for the questions, 30 seconds to one minute to answer since there are so many. So because, you know, they're on the hot seat tonight, so know that this is pretty, this is a difficult position you, we have put them in, so we do greatly appreciate that. Your closing, depending upon time, will be 30 seconds to one minute. We will try to give you one minute for closing as well. But thank you again for that. Okay. So now we will start with... Um, candidate introductions. You have one minute, Mr. Carlson. Just move the whole thing. Just pick up that whole, whole base. Thing, the whole darn thing. Yeah, there you there go. You go. <laughs> Good. Yep, there we go. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Glenn Carlson. Uh, I am lucky number seven on the ballot. Um, I am a Colorado Springs native. I've lived, worked, played, and volunteered here <coughs> my entire life. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to receive a full academic scholarship to Colorado College, where I eventually went on to get an economics degree. Um, after that, uh, I worked, uh, commuted to Denver because I just did not want to leave the Springs for almost a decade, and uh, worked for Colorado's largest company, where I was responsible for a global piece of business that was actually larger than our city's budget. And so. Um, after that, um, I met my wife, and then we started our own business where we have grown um, into our 10th year and now have 30 employees. And so uh, I've, I see the challenges people face and want to continue to tackle some of our, our biggest challenges. That thing's heavy. It is heavy. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Lynette Crow Iverson. Thank you for attending, and thank you for hosting this forum for us. Um, the city council don't have that many forums, so this is really nice. Um, I have been a resident of Colorado Springs for 30 years. I am a native of Colorado. I was born on the western slope and grew up on the eastern slope. I moved here in the 90s, and my first job was a labor and delivery nurse for six years. And after six years, I went into business with a physician and owned an occupational medicine clinic for 23 years. So I have grown a business and raised a family in Colorado Springs. And in those 23 years, I've served on many boards and commissions um, in regards to the city, higher education, plan COS. I was the board chair for um, Pikes Peak Workforce Development Board. So I've spent 23 years serving in many capacities of the city, um, understanding what the needs are as a resident, as well as a business owner. So thank you again for having me. It is really heavy. <laughs> Good evening, Chanita Davis. I'm named after my mother. Unfortunately, she did pass last October, but I plan to make her proud. Um, I have lived here since 83, came to, and went to Palmer High School, left, came back in 1992. I have three adult children that I raised here in Colorado Springs, five grandchildren, and I'm looking forward to them enjoying Colorado Springs as being the number one place to live. That's what drew me here. And um, I was encouraged to be involved with the political realm after I volunteered to work on several different leaders' campaign. Um, and I am planning to continue to serve my community just like I have done for over 20 years in this Colorado Springs community. I'm Kat. Hello. I'm Kat Gale. I grew up in northern Colorado in the land of love. My father was a professor at Colorado State University in forestry and wildlife biology. So because he was a college professor, I went to college as far away as I possibly could. And I went to college at Amherst in Massachusetts. Then I went to law school at Georgetown, met my husband on an airplane, and he's a U.S. diplomat. So I spent the next 30 years traveling the world, reinventing myself country by country. Most of the work I did was as a human rights advisor, building community, um, doing asylum petition for Sudanese refugees in Egypt to go to the EU. My most recent overseas job was in Haiti in the Democracy and Governance Department of USAID. So I've spent my life community building, and I thought it's high time I'd built some community here. So my goal 
in Colorado Springs is to give power to the people, power to the neighborhoods. Growth is good. We need growth to d- attract a more diverse workforce, but growth without limits is cancer. So I want to have neighbors have inputs in planning, and I will say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Jamin Johnson. I'm a 42-year-old entrepreneur and uh, community. Your mic's off. Yeah. My mic is off. That's probably for the best. <laughs> I, an open mic for me is dangerous. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Jamin Johnson. I'm a 42-year-old entrepreneur and a community advocate who has lived in Colorado Springs for the last 23 years, predominantly on uh, Colorado Springs South Side, uh, mostly in District 3. Um, I uh, moved here uh, out of high school, got, obtained my first job, my first apartment. Uh, I met my wife. Uh, we were married for 18 wonderful years before she passed from cancer. During that time, we were fortunate enough to open some businesses here in town. Uh, we uh, held several positions at several companies, and I began becoming very active in uh, local government, especially in uh, city council. Uh, I've worked as an advisor to some political political action committees, and I have advised legislators uh, both at the city, state, and across the country. So, thank you. And I want to uh, bridge the gap between constituent and council member. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. I'm a former state legislator. Uh, perhaps one of the only elected officials to uh, be running for city council at large. I'm running on a pledge to love my my neighbor. That is our campaign speech. And what does that mean? That means if elected, I pledge to vote the same way that I believe that you would vote if you were in my shoes and if I were in your shoes. And so as a man of compassion, I've uh, successfully uh, built two businesses. I've earned my MBA. And our charity not only gives away free coats to homeless veterans every other year in this town, but we feed almost a thousand orphans and widows, uh, many of them overseas. Uh, As an Air Force Academy graduate, as a 20-year veteran, I've served our community. I have uh, been a Navy chaplain, had an award-winning career there, and took a stand for your constitutional rights. My website is gordonforcolorado.com. I hope to earn your vote. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Okay. Um, we working? Okay, good. <laughs> My name is Dave Leinweber. Um, I've uh, I'm a native of Colorado. I've been married to my wife for 40 years. We have twins. Um, I've been in Colorado Springs for 32 years, and I own a small business, Anglers Covey, on the west side that's been successful for 26 years. I've been involved in all sorts of aspects throughout the city. I particularly have worked in the space of outdoor recreation, um, and I currently work at the city, state, and federal level. Um, In the city level, um, I um, was the founder of Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance, and at the state level, I sit on the executive team for the Office of Outdoor Recreation. And so I've been involved in many different aspects. I care about this city, I want to give back, and I'm, I'm here to do the best job I can do. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. I'm Roland Rainey. Um, I was actually born in Louisiana on a small sugarcane plantation on the Bayou region, but for the last 15 years, I've devoted and dedicated my life to Colorado Springs. I'm a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, combat veteran, served in Bagram, Afghanistan. I'm a former adjunct professor at Colorado State University where I taught globalization and international relations. Also a small business owner and a community leader. I've been on the board of directors uh, for the actual uh, Colorado Springs World Affairs Council, on the board of directors also for the Banning Lewis Academy School Board and also on the Fort District Judicial Nominating Commission where we select judges uh, and recommend those to the the, uh, governor. Uh, My biggest thing is safe neighborhoods. So I will tell you that's what you're gonna hear from me today. Our city, your future, that's my priority. Thank you. 
before we get to the next question, I'm probably going to do a, a quick mic adjustment. So we'll just give that a sec. All right. Are we good? Okay, great. Uh, so instead of doing uh, alphabetically now, we've, we're going to ask you questions based on uh, the number that you pulled out of your hat. Uh, and the first question, before we get started with audience questions, uh, this will be for Roland Rainey. Uh, Roland, how do you define smart growth as it pertains to the city? Oh, I'm sorry. And this will be a one-minute question for everybody. Smart growth. I think one of the things that we've seen with our city is people are attracted to come here. Why not? It's Colorado Springs. People should be attracted to come here. But with that growth, of course, brings about a lot of requirements, infrastructure, also public safety. One of the things about smart growth, the way I see it, is a balance. Uh, oftentimes with smart growth, you tend to start looking at developers, other stakeholders, coming in and building and building and building and people say oh well that's not smart growth well there's a balance you have to balance uh building to provide affordable homes but simultaneously you also have to make sure that the infrastructure is there so for me smart growth is making sure that in unison you have infrastructure properly aligned to address the amount of population growth that we are experiencing Next up would be Mr. Carlson. Same question. Same question. Yep. Okay. Matt and I were about to do a duet, <laughs> um, but she turned me down. Um, yeah, so you know, smart growth is, uh, you, you heard it's, it's a catchphrase. You've probably seen it everywhere on everybody's signs. Um, I'm gonna give you kind of my econ, my nerdy answer, economics answer, and then uh, hopefully follow that up with my human answer. Um, you know, I think when growth is modest and logical, um, I think most of us can manage it. We can handle it, we see it, we absorb it, we can adjust to it. Uh, but what we've seen over the past couple years was rapid growth, and it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. And what it causes is simply an overconsumption of resources as well. And so now we're starting to ask about energy and inflation and water and lumber and eggs, et cetera. And so we've got to tackle that. From the humanity standpoint, one of the reasons I have gotten involved in this is standing up for my neighborhood against a large project that just simply didn't make sense. And so uh, from the neighborhood standpoint, it was something that I'm passionate about. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, number three is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Hey, everybody. I'm Gordon Klingenschmidt. And uh, I think growth it can be measured in several different ways. One is uh, the human aspect, of course, not just numbers of people, but quality of life and the way that our community uh, uh, builds together and grows together depends, I think, on a second factor, which is economic growth. And as a fiscal conservative, I think I'm the only candidate running for city council who has openly pledged to try to lower your city sales tax so that we can all grow together. We have already seen uh, with recent inflation, the doubling of gasoline prices, the doubling of grocery prices. Uh, we can't afford a champagne and caviar style bureaucracy of big government that is over-regulating to choke out the growth and pe try chase people out of our town. Uh, why is our sales tax higher than Denver, Pueblo, Castle Rock? Uh, I'm a fiscal conservative and I wanna give that money back to you, Gordon Klingenschmidt. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you are number four. Thank you. Can, can you give me the phrasing of the question again? Uh, how do you define smart growth, uh, particularly you know, involving the city of Colorado Springs? Gotcha. Uh, I think smart growth is balanced growth. I think that we need to start uh, metering. Uh, I think we need to rein in sprawl by metering our annexations against our infill and restoration projects. I think we have a lot of good bones here. Uh, we got a lot of good, we have infrastructure and utility hookups that are in need of revitalization. And uh, we need to start focusing on freshening and with, with an emphasis on historic preservation, we need to start working on revitalizing some of our neighborhoods and slowing the sprawl. I think that if we make uh, uh, consideration for annexation contingent, on uh, applying for one of these um, approved infill projects, that would be one of the best ways of slowing 
uh, the rapid growth and making it more uh, sustainable and and with everyone in mind. So, uh, Kat Gale, you're number five. So smart, smart growth is considering all the aspects. It's considering the people who are already there. It's considering whether or not there's transportation to get there. There's something Colorado Springs has that's called a special taxation district. In the 80s, in order to in extend the infrastructure, the developers had a right to tax the people of the development. There's no oversight of this by the city, by the state. And in the 80s, a developer didn't build out enough, and so the few houses that were left in the area were left holding a tab of $30,000 each. Right now, there's something similar going on in Flying Horse. I think the tab for Flying Horse is at about a half a million. So we need to s decide if we're growing, can we extend our resources out there? We also need resources. We have the problem with water. They have water for no more annexation, but let's also evaluate whether infill can handle water, whether buildings of infill can handle escape in emergency situations. And then it goes fast, right? Uh, David Lineweaver, you're uh, number six. I think really um, the main point of this question is really how do we maintain the quality of life that we have but yet still grow in a, in a way that our kids will have jobs? I, I remember the uh, in the early 90s there used to be 20 pages or so of HUD homes um, just handed out for any price you want. We've been in a really bad place um, in terms of growth for Colorado Springs, but we've reversed that. Even 15 years ago, we were talking about how our young people were not going to want to live here. Well, we've reversed that. And so I think smart growth is always taking a caption of where we are right now. What are some adjustments we need to make? How do we tweak and incentivize the right things so that we're looking down the road in the future and planning correctly so that we maintain the quality of life that we all want to enjoy. Thank you. My name's Dave Leinweber. Thank you, David. Uh, Ms. Davis, you are next. I feel that smart growth requires common sense solutions. It doesn't require a degree so much as being able to take all of the variables that exist right at the time when we're having to make a decision and make a good decision. I feel that we need to just make sure that we continue to make Colorado Springs, like I said, number one. How did we get to number one before? Why aren't we number one now? So those are questions that I want to um, get an answer to for myself and for my community. And if you want to know a little bit more about me, go to my uh, webpage, chanitadavis.com. And uh, Lynette Crow Iverson, you are the last one for this question. Property rights and smart growth are both principles that must complement each other. We're, not, we're, we're in the middle of growing pains. We're not going to stop growing with 3,000 people a year moving to El Paso County, and the home COS site says in the next 15 years we're going to grow at 32%. So we need strong leadership to manage that. We can't stop growing, but we have to grow wisely. And with that, we need to make sure that our zoning and planning has a different look than it did five or ten years ago. We now know our water is at risk, and so we have to pay closer attention to water and our water resources. So it's going to be an all-hands-on-deck with the next mayor and the next city council. Um, we're at a tipping point, and so that is one of the main focuses that um, I will be looking at as we grow, because we're not going to stop growing. We just need to grow wisely. Thank you. So we're going to start with um, Mr. Carlson next. All right. Do you feel there needs to be more emphasis on minority hiring in management and upper level city jobs? As a, and as a follow up question, what are your plans for minority hiring overall in the next two years? How long do they have to answer? One minute. <laughs> One minute. One minute. One minute. Yeah, you know, so 
Um, my name is Glenn Carlson. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up, um, grow up in Southern Colorado Springs and went to a very diverse high school and worked at very diverse jobs. And as I've gotten older and lived and worked and, you know, played in different parts of town, I, you know, learned over the years that uh, not, not, not all areas look that way and not all areas and jobs and, and, you know, developments and housing communities look that way that I was used to growing up. And so, yeah, to answer your question, absolutely. I, I absolutely want to promote more diversity. I think we can all do better. Um, I think the rising tide lifts all boats. We are more diverse and we w when we welcome people from all different backgrounds, whether that's race, uh, you know, sex, income, et cetera. And so the, the short answer is yes. Thank you. Mr. Klingenschmidt. Thank you, Angie. Um, is my mic on? Thank you, Angie. Yeah. And it's a great question. Um, you know, everything uh, I learned about equal opportunity, I learned during my 20 years in the military. And uh, in that environment, there was zero tolerance for racism or discrimination. And, uh, you know, I have obeyed black commanders. I've hired black sergeants. Um, I have worked closely alongside of people of all different religions, all different creeds, uh, all different beliefs. Uh, as a Navy chaplain, I defended those people. And, and I defended uh, the little guy when they were mistreated by the, those in power. Uh, I believe with, in the principles that Dr. Martin Luther King espoused, and that is we should uh, treat people according to the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So I would support equality in hiring according to the most qualified person for the job uh, and not any other standard. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Um, Johnson's next. Uh, yes, Jamin Johnson, thank you. Um, well, if you follow my public uh, record, if you um, go to my website, you'll see that uh, diversity is actually one of the biggest uh, things that I'm aiming to accomplish uh, with my time on city council. Uh, it is my firm belief that uh, with diversity, you get more vantage points. Uh, our problems are multifaceted. When you have more vantage points, you can come up with more comprehensive solutions. Um, I believe that uh, the purpose and purview of council is to be reflective of the general body, to be able to make uh, decisions uh, with empathy, with them in mind, and uh, be able to determine the ramifications and the implications that it would have in people's lives. Uh, I think that uh, a more diverse uh, council, a more diverse uh, uh, administration would lend to uh, better solutions. So, thank you. Thank you. Gail's is next. Cat Gail, Cat Gail, candidate number four on 4-4. Four four. <laughs> One of the jobs I've had here is teaching for the citizenship class for people from all over the world. And when you look out into a class of people from Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Honduras, Guatemala, Burkina Faso, you know that all of them bring something to the table. Colorado Springs will be richer when we know their backstories. We will get new ideas from them. We can't keep growing the same way we've been growing for the past hundred years. Another part of diversity, I would be encourage more universal design, more access to people with disabilities in the management and into the city. So when we grow the house that people can age in, people can live for their entire life and pass away in. So as far as diversity, it's like soup. Soup is richer with the seasoning that we put in it. So the more perspectives, the smarter we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David Weinweber? Yes, um, I'm David Leinweber. Um, I believe that um, as a city, we always need to focus on hiring uh, the best and brightest that we can get that understands our community. And so that takes individuals that understands all of our community and knows how to elevate who we are and help us grow in a, uh, a way that's positive, that everyone can participate in and everybody can grow in. Um, 
I think we need to work on uh, diversity issues uh, constantly and understand the values that are there. Um, understand that um, everyone can come to the table and enjoy all the beauty and the quality of life that we have here in Colorado Springs. I think those are the key things. Thank you. I'm Dave Lineover. Thank you. Davis. I feel that our community is like a, a bowl of fruit. You have apples, oranges, bananas, all of the fruit we appreciate for its different qualities. And neither we, you know, do what we say, I get rid of the apples or the oranges. We like it all. So if we appreciate the qualities of each person and look for opportunities where we can um, actually bring in more diversity into top level positions, especially, then I, I think it will continue to make Colorado Springs the number one place to live. I'm Chanita Davis. Go to ChanitaDavis.com to learn more about me. Thank you. Crow Iverson. I was fortunate to be raised by parents that taught us at a very young age growing up that we are all the same. We all bleed the same and that other ideas, whether they're our view or not, are all important at the table. So lucky through my life and I have been able to see the world a little bit different um, growing up in my era as well as in the hospital working as a nurse, it, it didn't matter who, what they had done, you were there to serve them, you were there to take care of them. So I look at the world through that lens. And as a business owner, my, my business was made up of, of a melting pot. We brought everybody to the table based on, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't based on anything except their experience and their qualifications that came to the table. And I will govern at the, at the city in the same way that I was raised in the same way that my lens is, that you bring the most qualified regardless of their their race, regardless of their sex. And you do want to capture, as many have said, the most qualified people. She's gonna jump over here and choke me. She told me that if I didn't stop. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Next, Roland Rainey Jr. Thank you, Roland Rainey. So minority hiring, uh, the one thing I would start off with is promoting diversity, it actually allows a variation of perspectives, right? But in that variation of perspectives, one of the things we do is we get to become a stronger city. So that's something that we all need to understand about diversity. It's not always about how many blacks or Hispanics or, or whites or gender. It's looking at the entire perspective, whatever makes our city stronger. Now, I say that, but also, you know, I was in the military. Retired Lieutenant Colonel, as I already mentioned, a major melting pot. I'm on the board of directors for the Colorado Springs World Affairs Council. You can't get more diverse than that. Um, but what I will say is when we talk about our community, it's really about making what works best through the lens of our community and not just quickly going to the mat to say, well, I, I want to hire X amount of people, but they may not be qualified. I want the best qualified folks that represent our city. I saw your stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, we're going to start with Mr. Klingenschmidt, uh, and this is an audience question. Can you give an example of how you approach complex problems with opposing views? a real problem and how you solved it. And we'll make this a one minute question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. As a 20 year veteran, um, I used to be a, a consultant to three and four star generals over you know, a half billion dollar budget here at Space Command. Uh, and you can't get more complex than uh, you know, trying to balance the operational needs of, of the mission, the resources, the personnel, uh, and I have not just experience in, in that area of public service, but as a former legislator, I worked across the aisle with Democrats to, to pass uh, education initiatives, to, uh, to work on resolutions together, to come up with the right language, and I was the friendliest guy in the room. Although I voted conservative, I think I made many friends in the process. 
Finally, I've earned my MBA, and I've founded two successful businesses, uh, including a charity that is now building a vocational school in India. Talk about government regulation. Uh, we are uh, helping the future by building that community. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, Jamin Johnson, you're next. Do you need me to repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to each get a separate question. My apologies. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, can you give an example of how you approach complex problems with opposing views, a real problem, and how you solved it? Um, uh, I mean... What I can tell you, uh, citing in a specific example would be difficult at this time. Uh, I, what I can tell you is I've uh, been able to approach uh, complex situations with opposing views very amicably in the past. Um, one uh, you know, recent example I might be able to cite is during an interview, uh, you know, I was asked uh, what I would do in a certain situation. Um, the person told me that my, that my answer was very political in their opinion, that it was a standard political answer. Uh, I, uh, they were very uh, irate when they said this, but um, I, everyone in the room seemed impressed with my reaction. I was able to tell the gentleman and explain why my answer was sincere. And uh, it seemed that everyone was satisfied. At the end, they joked, uh, the next question was, how do you feel you uh, uh, work as a team? And uh, they seem satisfied with uh, the response. Thank you. Coming for you. Yep, she is. <laughs> She's creeping up there. Uh, Kat Gale, you're next. When I was the senior human rights advisor for USAID in Haiti, I was working primarily on getting the human trafficking rates down so that Haiti would qualify for USAID again. So one of the aspects that we were working on is the trafficking of children, whether it was for adoptions or for labor, for any number of other reasons. And so you had to work with other international players, the European Economic Community, Japan, the local religious and non-governmental organizations. And so we were trying to come up with a plan to know who the kids were. So the French donated a $5 million computer project because that computer project was going to track all the children. Well, Haiti doesn't have electricity, doesn't have computers, doesn't have air conditioning to cool the computers. So we had to work together, dig deep to see what we could bring from our Western perspectives that would help keep the children and keep Haiti's international aid. Cat Gale. <laughs> Thanks, Cat. Uh, Mr. Lineweaver, you are next. Uh, several years back, we we had kind of an interesting challenge where um, a greenback cutthroat trout was discovered in Bear Creek, and um, our city kind of tried to react to it. And instead of communicating with one another, all the different user groups in the outdoor industry brought out their lawyers. And um, it became kind of a big problem. Um, often in the outdoor rec space, you have all these different interests, whether you're a hunter, angler, whether you're an OHV, hiker, bird watcher, um, I can go on and on, handicapped access, et cetera, et cetera. I worked to bring all those groups together and form Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance. And together we're formulating a, a plan for our region on what outdoor recreation needs to look like in the future and how we balance that with conservation. And um, I can tell you that it, we've got everyone on board and it's working great. I'm Dave Lineweaver. Vote for me, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Davis? The number one thing would be to start with an open mind and then to have respect for others' opinion. When you're working with diverse backgrounds, people who have years of experience, they are always going to have quality, um, valuable, um, vital information that's going to make a better decision. So you would definitely, like I said, want to have an open mind and show respect for everyone's ideas. ShanitaDavis.com. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Crow Iverson. I have two examples. Am I on? Okay. I have 
two separate examples. My company was not recession, recession resistant. We served workforce. So we navigated our company through 9-11 and didn't lay anyone off. We navigated through the downturn of 2008, did not lay anyone off, and we grew through COVID. So those are some really tough years that we were able to manage and grow through that we survived, I survived um, tough times. Um, things I've done with opposition is I ran the first yes to see campaign and there was a lot of opposition because it was a tax in the city so that was really hard i ran this last pprta and i'm currently running the tops campaign and there's a lot of opposition there's people who don't see the importance and so listening listening to what they have to say really hearing what they have to say is really been beneficial because even though I disagree with maybe some of the opposition and the ugliness, you you just have to listen. Thank you, Mr. Rainey. Roland Rainey. So this is a great question because this really has to deal with us as city council uh, personnel looking for your vote. Complex issues, when you look at them, especially with opposing views, the first thing you have to do is listen. Just listen. Just stop and listen. I, my role is not to quickly give you an answer and say, this is the way we're going to operate the city. No, we need to listen to what you all are feeling out in your communities. Now, I've had a very unique, complex issue with opposing views that was very unique because this was nationwide, and that was when Colin Kaepernick uh, took a knee. Well, at the same time, I was the founder and owner of a semi-professional football team. So what did I do, especially as a lieutenant colonel, uh, representing that American flag? And you better believe I listened to my players, I understand their point of view, but we came to a consensus that said we represent our country and our flag and even though at the national level they're doing this we will stand with our hand over our heart for our flag so that was very complex and he said here she goes okay i'm stopping <laughs> <laughs> all right uh and uh mr carlson if you would close us out on this question thank you appreciate it um if i could before you start the clock uh there's a <laughs> There's a local legend, I think June is trying to get in, but we have a seat right here, and she's sitting outside. Oh, yeah. Could we get her in? She's pretty important to uh, all things COS. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. There's another seat here if you like it. Um, Dude, look at these look at these gentlemen man all right thanks guys I appreciate that that's awesome see that's exactly why I love COS right there all right you can start the clock now uh, what were we talking about no, I'm just kidding um, no my name is Glenn Carlson again number seven on the ballot two things really come to mind here um, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a business owner, um, but it's another thing to have a large staff. And so we've got about 30 employees now, some motivated by money, some motivated by title, some uh, have recently started families, some are buying their first house. So you've got to deal with all these different, it's a large pinball machine and your goal is to, you know, just try to keep it, keep the chaos at a minimum. And so you know, you deal with conflict um, and you really just try to consensus build, really understand people, what their motives are, what their, you know, what viewpoint they're coming at you from, um, and really just consensus build and listen. And that's the first step. Um, I probably don't have enough time to elaborate on my second point, <laughs> but thanks anyways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so this is another um, audience question. And we will start with Mr. Jamin Johnson. What is your favorite open space in Colorado Springs? And how, are you, how do you support its future? One minute. Um, well, my favorite current open space would be uh, Seven Falls, or I'm sorry, um, Helen Hunt Falls. It's near my house. And I go there frequently to uh, go on walks and hikes. Uh, prior to that, my favorite open space was Strawberry Fields. 
Uh, I think um, that a lot of the people in the community were upset about the uh, at the Broadmoor's acquisition of Strawberry Fields and uh, the city uh, selling one of our legacy parks uh, to a private entity. Uh, in the future, I will make sure that Tops has first uh, uh, right of refusal, uh, and I will fight to make sure that uh, city-owned parks remain city-owned parks and uh, that public land remains in the public domain. Thank you. Cat Gale. I love, Red, I love Red Rock Canyon open space. I'm wondering what's being done with the maintenance now because you always have the bicycles versus the dog walkers versus the hiker conflict. But I love the history of it. I love that it's reclaimed from a quarry. I love that it's Colorado Springs secret space that's not overrun by tourists like Garden of the Gods. I think it's wonderful because it shows what tops can do when we all work together. But we have to be very, very careful that the TOPS funds are not misused and redirected to other things like maintaining municipal parks when it's to acquire open space and the stewardship of open space and trails and new parks. Thank you. Thank you. David Linweber. Thank you. Um, David Linweber. Um, well, my favorite would probably be uh, Red Rock Park also because uh, we live very close to there. Um, I remember when it was just a, a quarry. Actually, it, it used to be a landfill um, uh, years ago. And when that property um, was available, it was great that um, our TOPS program could come in and buy it instead of having it developed because it's such an amazing natural resource for us. And just being able to walk and get lost on the trail and and those kind of things with my dog um, is just such a great asset and such a mental healing piece um, that um, I think we need to constantly look for ways to develop and grow our open spaces um, to really take advantage of the health benefits we get when we get outside. Um, so that would be um, my favorite, although there's several others. David Langover, thank you. Thank you. Shanita Davis. I really appreciate all of our open spaces. I actually belong to a hiking group, and I'm out there all the time. So I'm for tops also. ShanitaDavis.com. <laughs> <laughs> Lynette Crow Iverson. My favorite park is still Garden of the Gods. You, I mean, there is no time seasonal you can get lost in there in the summer I know there's a lot of people but just you can drive through it and you get to the other side and you just feel different you see so much nature so many different birds the sheep are amazing right now if you haven't seen them there's probably 24 sheep in there today it is just it is it just takes you away when you need to get away and so Garden of the Gods is still one of the seven wonders of the world and my favorite park Thank you. Roland Rainey Jr. Oh, thanks for the junior part. Appreciate that. <laughs> now, one of my favorite open spaces is uh, Garden of the Gods also. Uh, and one of the reasons, it's, it's who we are. It's our character. When you really start asking yourself, what's the character of Colorado Springs, and you start looking at kind of the base of Pikes Peak, and you start seeing the canyons and the rocks and the, the small streams and parks, it's who we are. It's what defines us. It's what we look like. So going to the guys, I, I, there's been times I've been up there and I just kind of look out on the city and I go, wow, I actually live here. I have a leadership role in this city. And, and sometimes I'm like with awe that, wow, this is, this is pretty special. So Roland Rainey. Thank you. Junior. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, <laughs> Glenn Carlson. That, this was tough. As I started formulating my answer, I was thinking, you know, probably Blodgett. But wait, then you've got the garden, Corral Bluffs, yeah. even the paint mines, uh, Palmer. I mean, it's hard to even pick one, honestly. But if I had to pick one, um, it'd probably be sec Section 16. Oddly enough, I had never been to Section 16 until about two or three years ago. 
Uh, and then my wife said, you're, you're crazy. You've lived here. You've advocated for parks. You were the president of the Trails and Open Space Coalition, and you've never been to Section 16. I, I mean, I thought she was going to beat me up and leave me on the trail. Um, um, but um, yeah, you know, we're really blessed. I've advocated and worked, uh, like I said, as the president of Trails and Open Space Coalition for many years on many of the projects. And we've uh, been fortunate to have acquired a lot of land and opened up new parks, um, you know, as a direct result of that effort. And so we're lucky and just don't ever take it for granted. That's all I ever ask. Thank you. And to finish out, Mr. Gordon Klingenschmidt. Thank you for the question. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Uh, you know, I first fell in love with our beautiful mountains when I came here in 1986 to the Air Force Academy. And as a cadet, I remember going into Garden of the Gods Park with a you know, rope climbing course and rappelling and uh, just being outdoors I, it made me fall in love with the city. And I, I told my mother that year I plan to retire in Colorado Springs because of our beautiful open spaces. Uh, whenever I have a visitor come into town, I always drive them through Garden of the Gods. If they have time to hike with me, then I go over to Red Rocks Park and we, you know, walk the trails. You can get lost up in there. Uh, probably need more porta potties, to be honest. Uh, but but I would I would love to um, prioritize that in the city budget if TOPS is not passed by the voters. As you know, it's on the ballot. I hope it passes. Uh, but we need a plan B, and that is to prioritize it along with supporting our police and our roads. Parks are up in my, uh, say, top five priorities. Okay. Uh, why don't we do a quick, we'll try to make this a 30 second so we can get a couple more in before the end of our time. And we're going to start with Kat Gale. Uh, also, a, an audience question. If you got a million dollars to spend in any way in the city, what would you do with it? 30 seconds. I'd buy open space east of town, east of the city. It's, we're building like crazy. We're the pronghorn going. We need biodiversity. We need paths from one open space to the next. And nobody's making any more land, so we need to preserve it while we have it. Cat Gale, candidate 444. Mr. Lineweber. I, if I had a million dollars and I wanted to invest it in the city, I would totally invest it into a mental health uh, facility. Uh, it, our mental health issue right now is at a crisis level, and I'm surprised there's no question about it. When we're number one in the state in suicides, that should be our top priority. And so um, everything I will be focused on with all the other duties, um, when I have the extra time, I'm going to be working on the mental health issue that is so important to our community. Thank you. Ms. Davis? She cracked me up. But. <clears throat> I feel that uh, unhoused people are the most important issue in this city. Um, this, there is no reason that people should be outside during the night. And I would definitely make it a situation to where they would want to be inside and feel dignified about being inside. That's what I would invest my million dollars in. Please go to ChanitaDavis.com. Ms. Carol Iverson? If I had a million dollars right now to invest into our city, it would be into our police and fire. Right now we're short 60 to 80 police officers. We have a budget of 120000 more. However, we need a school for police officers. We need we need more money for retention. We have got to find a way to retain and acquire more police officers, whether that's an, at a school, putting money into something like that, or more benefits and pay. But that's where I'd spend my money. Mr. Rainey Jr. Roland Rainey Jr. I will spend that million dollars in public safety. Right now, homicide up 22%. We got uh, a massive issue with uh, motor thefts. At the end of the day, you can't live the quality of life in Colorado Springs that you want because safety is an issue. So my million will go to the CSPD and make sure that we have a very advanced emergency operations center that they can operate out of to make sure that all of you can carry out your quality of life 
because you want to be safe every day. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit, a little bit on this answer. Glenn Carlson, um, I would probably take half of it and do my best to preserve some of our uh, outdoor spaces as best as possible. And then uh, as a frequent donor and somebody that's been involved in the community with a lot of nonprofits over the years that I've lived here, I would probably split the rest up among them and let them do their great work. I'm going to give a shout out to some of these right now because I have the time so far. But, you know, the Humane Society, we're big dog lovers, Rocky Mountain Field Institute, Trails and Open Space Coalition, Adopt a Village. <laughs> <laughs> you got one without being choked. All right. Uh, Mr. Klingenschmidt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> when I announced, I said our top three priorities for my campaign would be, number one, to support our first responders, hire more police, support our firemen and, and EMTs. Uh, number two is roads and infrastructure so our city can grow together. But number three, if the million dollars is after we've already spent our budget, you've got to give it back to the taxpayers. I'm a strong advocate for Tabor rights, and if the taxpayers don't vote to spend that extra money, then they deserve it in a refund. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Okay, uh, and Mr. Johnson, if you would close this question out, 30 seconds. Sure. Um, first, uh, is this on? Okay. First, I, I commend Carlson with his Oprah style approach. You get some money, you get some money. I like that. Uh, but since uh, Mr. Lineweber uh, correctly uh, addressed our need for mental health and the fact that it encompasses so much of what else uh, the, uh, the uh, candidates were discussing. If I had a million dollars earmarked towards any community project I want, I would do emergency medical and uh, community health uh, facilities on Colorado Springs Southeast side, which is uh, notoriously underserved when it comes to that. So <laughs> throw it at me next time, sorry. <laughs> Oh, we did oh, 30 seconds. No, one more question. One, one more question? Yep. Yeah, that's the same thing. How long do we have? 30 seconds. One. This one for 30 seconds, and no, then you can do one more. Seconds. Okay. Um, this is a 30-second question. Who did we start with last time? Uh, you're going to be on uh, Mr. Lineweber is starting this one. Okay. Um, in 30 seconds or less, how do you plan to involve residents in your decision-making? Well, I think, um, hi, my name's Dave Lineover. Um, I think you have to look at each group uh, or each segment of our uh, community and find the right way to kind of uh, get their input. Um, it could be town halls. It could be other things. Some people can't, don't have transportation. I think you have to be very creative to kind of look at all those different areas and then be receptive to, to how to get out and discover what the community needs um, through different ways to meet with them. Thank you. That was my only... Janita Davis. I involve myself in the community every day. I'm out in the community. I never meet a stranger. And I, I, I start conversations with people constantly. So I will continue that same behavior about any issue that it's come before me. I'll continue to have a conversation at the grocery store, at the post office, when I walk down the street. ChanitaDavis.com. Thank you. Lynette Crow Iverson. We have so many avenues of it, of communication these days compared to before. We are we have town halls. We have so many community events that each one of our, of us are at. We have open session at council meetings for utilities and for um, city council. I think it's just a matter of really listening, listening to what people have to say, returning their emails, returning their their. I'm going to get choked. Roland Rainey, <laughs> Jr. <laughs> <laughs> there's three areas, and I there's often where I will not commit to something on a campaign because there's a lot to learn, but I'm committing to these three right now. One, quarterly town halls. Got to happen. Got to have you there. 
Two, biannually roundtables, and that will consist of various businesses randomly selected to come have a roundtable session so we can just have a conversation. That's all, just a conversation. Three, we got Zoom and other technology. Let's use it randomly so we can talk to you, the citizens. Glenn Carlson. Uh, <clears throat> Glenn Carlson, in, after going through this battle against this large development, I've learned that not everybody receives information the same way. And so while the green little notification postcards that we get for the city are a nice thought, not everybody receives them nor is responsive to them. And so I think you've got to use different methodologies and communication tool sets to reach people where they are, whether it's mail, text, um, social media, um, and, you know, even even canvassing and phone calls at some time uh, to some extent. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Gordon Klingenschmidt. Thank you. As a former state legislator, my name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. I was active in uh, not only responding to every email from every constituent, but actually publishing my cell phone so people can call me directly. Uh, I'm one of the only people at this table who is not actively seeking campaign donations from special interest groups. I'm here to represent the people, and I advocate for transparency in government and uh, open budgeting process. Make sure all the facts are published so that the public knows just as much as I do and that I can represent you. Gordon Klingitschmidt. Thank you. Jamin Johnson. Thank you. Um, I like to view the question as how the public would utilize me in their decision making, but um, the uh, I've always felt, I've long held that it's the best practice to engage the community you're looking to address, whether it's diversity, whether it's emergency evacuation, whether it's homelessness, you have to incorporate the very people you're looking to address and you have to listen to them. And I do agree that we need to incorporate uh, current technology and so that we can better engage the community. Thank you. Thank you. And to close out the question, Kat Gale. Cat Gale, my number one priority is giving voices to the people in all of these development decisions. Glenn speaking about what's happening on the west side with 2424. On the north side, we have an amphitheater that all of the residents in the surrounding areas were against. It passed anyway. Then you look down South Mill Street by the Drake Power Plant. People are desperate to protect the character of their neighborhood. People have lived there for generations. I would have town halls. I will have office hours. I would reverse retool COS where they're not letting people have access to planning meetings. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm told we have time for one more question before we do closing remarks. Let's do one minute and uh, Ms. Davis, you'll start this one. Uh, how, to, how do you propose to address the city's homelessness crisis? Homelessness crisis. Well, I did mention that I would spend my million dollars on <laughs> the unhoused. But I do feel like what would really be valuable would be to have an actual database. There's only a little over a thousand people who are considered uh, unhoused. And if we had their information, their background, where they're from, who their family members are, we could help them to be able to uh, get back into uh, having a more healthy lifestyle. If we had more information, a database, we could even pair them up with charitable um, uh, organizations who would be willing to basically sponsor them. Kind of like if an illegal alien decides that they want to come to the United States of America, they have to have a sponsor. So I feel that each uh, unhoused person, if they had a sponsor that could uh, ease them back into uh, living in, indoors because I know a lot of people just they're out of the habit of living indoors. Um, it would really um, help the situation or uh, actually uh, solve it. <laughs> solve it. All right, thank you. That's, that, that's my, this Ms. Crow my. Iverson, one minute. Can you ask it again? I was. Uh, yep, if elected, how would you address the homelessness crisis? <coughs> Homelessness is going to take an all hands on deck between the city and the organizations that are leading the effort to relieve this issue. It isn't the government's job to stop homelessness. It, it is our job to 
create an ecosystem and come alongside the organizations that do it best and the organizations that do that day in and day out and that are working on specifically that topic. Um, homelessness, it's a ripple effect through our community, and it affects every single one of us based on the use of hospitals, the use of our police, the use of even fire. It's very expensive. According to HUD, it costs over $40,000 per person that's homeless on our streets, and it's something we do have to get a hold of. Thank you. Mr. Rainey, Jr. So the first thing about our homelessness issue here is for us to really understand who issue is it? Is it CSPD's issue or is it our issue as a community? And I will tell you, I'm an advocate of it's a community issue. We cannot continue to put the pressure on CSPD to eradicate homelessness. That is not their job, Jar, on our behalf. That's a community thing. So I can tell you within the first year, one of the things I would do is put together a, or with my constituents, put together a city task force that is encompassing of many different entities, nonprofits, uh, multiple missions and shelters, and also community leaders and community volunteers. Get together, have a task force, so we can collectively look at issues from around the nation, around the globe, things that maybe we can look at and take pointers from. London has a great program called London for Buses. It's very unique and something that maybe we can take some tips from. So this is a community issue, not a CSPD issue. Thank you. Mr. Carlson. Thank you. Uh, Glenn Carlson. You know, I think we're guilty of trying to say, I have a fix for that. And the reality is that homelessness is a multifaceted issue. And I, I, I kind of put it in three buckets. Um, you know, you've got one where maybe there's a death of a spouse, the loss of a job, uh, usually temporary homelessness. They need to get, be connected to the resources to get them out of that situation. And then we've also got things like mental illness, addiction, disability, et cetera. That requires a totally different approach. And then you've got the true, uh, true transient community, which also requires a different approach. And so um, while it's easy and convenient to sit here and say, I, I'd fix it in one fell swoop, it's much more complicated than that. Um, you know, we've had some success here re in recent years with uh, some of our public-private partnerships, such as Pikes Peak Rescue, Rescue Mission, Greco Housing, um, among others. And so I think we need to keep uh, just double down on that effort and make sure that we're working with those partners that are experts in those fields uh, to give them the tools they need to, you know, uh, to try to fix some of this. Thank you. Mr. Klingenschmidt. Thank you. My name is uh, Gordon Klingenschmidt. As a compassionate conservative, I believe the homeless, uh, people experiencing homelessness, first of all, need our compassion. And when I was a Navy chaplain, I used to take my sailors every Friday downtown uh, Norfolk, Virginia to feed the homeless, and we won six awards, including best in the Navy for caring for the poor. Uh, here in this town, our, our charity works alongside the Marion House Soup Kitchen and the Colorado Springs Rescue Mission. We give free coats to homeless veterans. And yet, there is a public safety element. I will support the mayor uh, who will enforce the state law that allows the cleaning out of uh, dangerous camping sites if there are enough charity beds for the poor. We have that luxury here in Colorado Springs. We have enough beds. Uh, in Denver, they don't have that luxury. So you see them camping outside of the state legislature and needles on the ground, and it's an unsafe condition. Uh, law enforcement, will work alongside of our charitable resources. I'm Gordon Klingenschmidt. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Jamin Johnson. Um, I want to first commend the candidates who correctly uh, assess that this is going to take a multi-prong approach with a collaborative effort uh, across government, business, and nonprofits. That's absolutely true. Uh, I would like to expound on the facet that uh, uh, candidate Carlson uh, spoke on. We have to be able to delineate uh, the difference between those who are experiencing houselessness and, tho and the chronically homeless. Uh, the chronically homeless who may be experiencing this due to mental health, develop uh, developmental disabilities, or addiction. Um, and uh, uh, 
you know, I remember one time I met with a council member uh, and I, uh, about 10 years ago, and I was expressing that I was concerned that some of the decisions council was making was going to leave me and my wife homeless. Well, he had met some of my family, and he said, well, you won't be homeless. You can go and stay with your father. It's true that the vast majority of our homeless are unseen. Uh, if you're sleeping on someone's couch and you do not have a home of your own, you are homeless, and we need to learn, uh, we need to involve the community so we can better define this. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Gale? I would start, Cat Gale, I would start with the housing first approach because as long as we're concerned about moving people away, we never can get a true handle on who needs what. If you're housed, then other resources can be nearby, whether it's mental health, whether it's food, whether it's job training. As they said, unhoused could be a temporary situation. And this is not something that's all drug addicts and alcoholics. One or two bad decisions are a piece of bad luck and you're on the street. So we really, really should look to other countries, other states that have the best practices. Utah does an incredible job with Housing First, as does Columbus, Ohio. Because when you have people in a community, you can have mental health resources, you can have food resources, you can have drug treatment, and you also have experts in trauma-focused housing so that the housing that is available to them is not another cause of stress. Thank you. Kat Gale. Thank you. And Mr. Leinweber, you're last. So as a community, um, my name is Dave Leinweber. Um, as a community, if you compare us to other cities, you will actually see that we're actually doing quite well. Um, um, our leadership has done a very good job facing the fact that this is a national issue. Uh, my business is right on Fountain Creek, and I have a personal experience of working with the homeless there and dealing with them on a regular basis from uh, gunfights to fires to ongoing. And I can tell you firsthand that the issue is mental health and drugs. That's the part of homelessness that we see. And right now, we don't have any good way to take care of people. If you do not have insurance, our mental health facility is the county jail. The county jail is where they go. And then when it's full, they just release them. They can't do anything else. So we haven't really taken care of that problem with mental health. That's the issue, mental health. My name's Dave Leinweber. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will do closing remarks. Uh, they get a minute? Yep. Okay. And we will start um, with Mr. Rainey, Ronald Rainey. One minute. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and Junior. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Roland Rainey, Jr., uh, I'm one of those individuals who love to look at complex problems and bring about very simple solutions. I think I have... Uh, the experience, well over 30 years of leading large and small organizations. Also, my current involvement here in the city, from the you know, World Affairs Council to school board to the judicial side of the house, definitely shows my commitment to this city. I believe this city should be creating the environment for everyone to thrive, so you can build families here, so you can invest here, so you can actually see a promise of living here for you know years on end until your elder ages. So when I see Colorado Springs, I want you all to think, our city, your future, my priority. RolandRainey.com. Thank you. Mr. David Lineweber. <coughs> thought we were going to stay in the same order. <laughs> oh, I get it now. Okay. Sorry. You just surprised me a little bit there. All right. Well, um, my name is David Leinweber, and I'm, um, I've been in this community a long time, and I love this community. Um, I have given back because this 
community has given me so much. Um, we were able to invest um, and start um, a small, tiny, uh, small business and grow it. And, and now we have um, 18 employees and upwards of 30 guides that we support in our fly fishing industry. Um, that took a lot of effort and time to kind of do that. Um, I have brought together the community through the Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance, and I've demonstrated that collaboration is really the key to, to how I like to come and take on problems. Um, I want to be um, your vote for this election because I want to really give back in a way that is meaningful our city. I think we're in a pivotal, to pivotal time right now, and um, we've got some amazing things going on. So anyway, I'd like you to vote for me, Dave Leinweber. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Klingenschmidt. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to the League of Women Voters and uh, 635 and the NAACP for facilitating this event. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Uh, I'm running for city council at large on a pledge to love your neighbor, which means, again, I pledge, if elected, to vote the same way that I believe you would vote if you were in my shoes and if I were in your shoes. And that means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I have the experience as a former legislator of being a fiscal conservative. My top three priorities are, number one, public safety to support our first responders, number two, roads and infrastructure to support our growth, and number three, tax cuts. I'm the only one pledging to reduce our city sales tax. Uh, I've served our country for 20 years in uniform. I've earned my MBA, founded two successful businesses. I've led a national charity that helps feed the poor. As a compassionate conservative, I ask for your vote. My website is gordonforcolorado.com. My name is Gordon Klingenschmidt. Thank you. Jamin Johnson. Thank you. My name is Jamin Johnson. Um, uh, first, I would want to start by also thanking uh, the League of Women Voters and KRCC for uh, hosting this forum and their dedication to promoting education and civic engagement, and we thank you for that. Uh, I'd also like to say that I'm thrilled uh, at the diverse and talented group of candidates running for office this year. And if I uh, had one message for the public, I would say, if this was your future dais right here, we would be in really good shape, guys. This is, uh, you're looking at a really group, a good group of candidates. Uh, unfortunately, there are only three at-large positions, so you have to weigh these candidates against the open positions and who's already on the dais. And there is a chance that we could have more of the same or there's a chance for real change, real new vantage points, and uh, bringing real freshness to the dais. And I hope you seize this opportunity as the public and as the citizens uh, to take your dais and make it what you would like it to be. Thank you. Cat Gale. Cat Gale, when you make a budget, as city council members do, you're making moral decisions. You're choosing where to emphasize in your city, in your city's identity. We're talking about public safety. To improve public safety, we need more money. I would like to attract a more diversified workforce because right now we are pretty tax, sales tax dependent. And in the next recession, people don't go to restaurants, people don't spend extra money. So if we could bring in a higher wage workforce, greater spending. Also, I would double if not maybe triple the LART. I didn't know what the LART was until I started running. It's lodging and auto rental tax. That way, the tourists who are coming, who are burdening the infrastructure, anytime they drive anywhere, it's roads that we pave that they're using. It doesn't cost us anything, so Gordon, don't be afraid. I'm not raising your taxes, but it would bring a significant amount more into our city coffers. Cat Gale, City Council. KatherineGaleCouncil.com. Thank you. Shanita Davis. Whenever people ask me, well, what, what was your name? I, I, I tell them it's chi, like the energy that flows through your body. I'm a pretty neat person, and I usually add a t on the end, you know. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, at the orientation for city council, they told me I heard this, do not make any promises. So I do promise that I will use out of the box thinking it won't be the same type of um, 
thinking that has gone into our leadership at this time. So I promise to be out of the box. So thank you very much. Thank you. Lynetta Crow Iverson. Lynette Crow Iverson, thank you for having us. This is very much appreciated. Uh, my first priority is public safety. Colorado Springs has the highest homicide and auto, th auto theft rates that we've had in history, and that is unacceptable for Colorado Springs. We're better than that, and we can do better. That is one of my priorities. The second priority is infrastructure. We have to maintain the infrastructure. It's a critical component of our city, and if we don't, if, as we continue to grow, and I said we will grow, we have to have a healthy infrastructure. And my third a priority is economic development. We have to continue to bring companies here and have higher paying jobs and jobs for everyone. It's an ecosystem. We can have the lower paying jobs that get the high school kids and the, and the people going through school in, and we, we have to climb that up with higher paying jobs, and we need that ecosystem. So economic development so that you're, you can keep your family here, grow your family. I have two daughters and two granddaughters. I care about your kids. I care about your children and their children's children, and I want them to be able to have a beautiful city as well. Thank you. Glenn Carlson to finish the evening. All right, thank you. Uh, Glenn Carlson, thanks for having us. This is much appreciated, as always. Um, you know, having lived here uh, my entire life, uh, I've been involved in countless projects and organizations throughout the community for a long time. Um, I just thought of this, but I founded a scholarship um, in my 20s, and so oddly enough, while I was still paying off my student loans, I was sending money to kids here locally so that they could further ch and try to achieve their dreams. And so uh, I, I think there's no question that I love Colorado Springs and everything it's about. Um, you know, as I mentioned, my wife and I frequently donate and volunteer here to lots of various great organizations. Um, but quite simply, my goal is to continue to make Colorado Springs uh, a great place to live, work, and play. And all of those are, are things that add up to what I you know, think is the most important thing, which is quality of life. Um, and so at 39 years old, you'll notice I bring a different set of qualities to council that I think is missing. And uh, I bring experience and understanding of challenges in our city, but most importantly, the energy to tackle them. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for all the candidates? Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, so we're going to do a real quick close just to kind of tell you thank you to the candidates again. We put you on the hot seat. That's a it's an impressive night that you've done. And you've got one more for us, right? Remember, you have another forum on March 21st. Your location is Sand Creek High School. Um, so for us as the league, you also have a couple mayoral forums next week. You have one Monday at Library 21C, one on Saturday the 18th at um, Hillside Community Center. Whoop, whoop. Um, um, our topic for that, I know, thank you for that. Our topic, and that one is actually going to be water, environment, and transportation. So if you included a um, one of those types of questions, like transportation, because I know there were a couple, those will be asked at that forum in particular for the mayor's race. I know we may get it for next time as well. But um, vote 411 for you candidates. If you didn't fill out that survey for the league, please make sure you fill that out. That goes live next week, right? Ballots are mailed on tomorrow. Um, Sorry, and oh, and Citizens Projects, uh, sorry, Citizens Project Survey as well. Thank you. So you should have a couple of surveys in there. If you wouldn't mind filling those out, we would greatly appreciate that. And as voters, right, Vote 411 is your portal for answers to any questions that you have of these candidates. Hopefully it's the ones that you're wanting. But um, And that goes live mid-March next week sometime, I believe. So um, again, candidates and voters, I am going to ask you as voters, right you're here for a reason you are an active and engaged and informed citizen right so we are going to specifically ask you make sure you're talking about getting out the vote with your neighbors and people that you work with and people that are just on the street i don't care i do it i ask them, my waitress are you a registered voter are you are you voting so please do that and if you're doing that you should really be a league member just an fyi but i'm just saying um because we are a member organization what else? Um, thank you to our moderators. You guys did great this evening. Appreciate you and all of our co-sponsors, right? Round of applause for our moderators. <laughs> and all of those co-sponsors, we've got NAACP, Citizens Project, Black and Latino Leadership Coalition, Latina Equity Foundation, 
KRCC, 6035 Media, and of course, Studio 809 Podcast. Thank you, Dave, for being all of our technical, and you're awesome as well, our cameraman, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate you. Um, all right. Anything else I forgot, League members? Am I missing anything? There we go. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room, but if you're talking to people as well, right, and they don't know, so they don't get that thing afterwards, right? She's, Liz is exactly right. Tell them to sign your ballot just like you sign your driver's license. Yes, sir. I don't think it's on. Sorry. Um, yeah, so several of the candidates in, a, in, a, uh, in an attempt to be transparent and to be uh, open communication lines with the citizens have done a unified uh, email address. Uh, more candidates to join, I hope. Um, but you can, if you had questions for the candidates that you saw here tonight, a lot of them can be reached at allcandidates2023 at gmail.com. And, uh, and also an inv open invitation to the remaining candidates if they would like to join in on that as well. I was going to say, Thank we you. still have a few minutes. Please stop and ask your candidates if your question was not answered. Please stay for a few more minutes as we clean up the room. You're welcome to chat right in that lobby and enjoy. Again, thank you all for attending. Thank you so much for your participation in voting. This is 6035 Media.